do it your way. Do, you know, build this company your way. It is, it is your kind of your dream, your, your company. Um, and that's not to say don't take advice from others. Um, but, you know, as we were talking about earlier, take that advice, but never lose track of your way of doing it. Never lose track of your dream because that's what your company is. This is the Entrepreneur Way with Neil Ball. Unlocking the secrets of successful entrepreneurs seven days a week. Subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Twitter at Neil D. Ball. Napoleon Hill said the power of the mastermind is the driving force. To discover how you can unlock the potential in your business using the power of a mastermind, go to mastermindunlimited.com. And now, here is your host, Neil Ball. Hello, it's Neil Ball here. Thank you so much for joining me today on The Entrepreneur Way. The Entrepreneur Way is about the entrepreneur's journey, the vision, the mindset, the commitment, the sacrifice, failures and successes. I'm so excited to bring you our special guest today, Elizabeth Greenberg. But before I do, I have a little bit of trivia for you. Eugene Cernan said, Curiosity is the essence of human existence. Who are we? Where are we? Where do we come from? Where are we going? I don't know. I don't have the answers to those questions. I don't know what's over there around the corner, but I want to find out. The Entrepreneur Way asks the questions so we all get the insights, inspiration and ideas to apply in our businesses. Elizabeth, welcome to the show. Are you ready to share your version of the entrepreneur way with us? Yes, I am. Fantastic. Thank you for coming on the show. Elizabeth Greenberg graduated from Elon University with a BSBA in marketing and entrepreneurship. Upon graduation, she decided to pursue her business startup, Nonsense Flowers. While bootstrapping the company, modelled as a social enterprise, Elizabeth also works as a freelancer, maintains a number of personal and professional blogs, and teaches horseback riding lessons as well. Elizabeth, can you provide us with some more insight into your business and personal life to allow us to get to know more about what you do and who you are? Of course. So um, on on the business side, um, obviously nonsense is uh, the main thing that I do. Um, but the the freelance work and the, the horses really stem from just what I enjoyed doing. Um, I've always enjoyed writing. Um, I studied marketing, so it, it was kind of something that was of great interest to me. Um, and I, I really get to have fun uh, doing those different kinds of things, writing for um you know, writing for fashion companies, beauty companies, um, writing for, you know, horse related things, um, working with people on their business models, their plans, um, any kind of branding. So I get to have a lot of fun with that, which, um, which kind of keeps things lively. Uh, it can really get kind of, you know, dark sometimes when you're working on your own and trying to get something off the ground. It's, um, it's a, it's a long process, so it's it's nice to have something else that's uh, a bit more fun and um, and uh, kind of rounded, I guess. And then on the personal side, um, it, everything kind of overlaps. The the horseback riding um, teaching lessons really came from a love since I was maybe five years old of horses. Um, and I just was lucky enough to have a mom that said, okay, you can ride a pony. When I asked as every little girl does, mommy, can I have a pony? (laughs) So I didn't quite get it, but at least I got a lesson on it. And that kind of started, um, a lifelong love for me, um, and a very good, um, de-stressor. Uh, so, uh, between the horse, I also have, um, three rescue animals, two cats and a dog. Um, so they, they keep me, they keep me very busy. And, um, I, every now and then, um, like I said, being an entrepreneur can be a, a kind of lonely journey. If you're just working on 
on your own or with a small team. So uh, I try and get out in uh, my local community and there are different types of dance classes and um, events that go on. So I try and kind of mesh everything together, which, which makes it fun for me. Yeah. Okay. Elizabeth, can you just tell us a little bit more about your business, Nonsense? Because obviously there's a story behind this, isn't there, about how you set it up. It'd be interesting to hear about that. Of course. Um, So I was a a first-year student at Elon University when a friend of mine uh, had to be brought to the hospital and uh, was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. Um, And I had had uh, a lot of relatives, a lot of family members, both parents, my grandparents. Um, A lot of people that I've known have had cancer, but I've never been the one who was um, kind of in charge of buying the gifts or or expressing um, sympathy or good wishes, things like that. And this was, so this was the first time that, um, you know, I was the one going to the hospital, bringing something to visit my friend. Um, and it was all on me. So when I called to see uh, what room and what unit to send flowers, because that's that's the traditional thing that you send to someone in the hospital. The nurses said, um, I'm sorry, but live flowers aren't allowed in, in the unit that your friend is in because of a risk of airborne allergens um, and also a risk of um, bacteria growing in the water and, and things like that. So so she said, I'm, I'm sorry, but you just can't send anything to those units. Well, I wasn't I wasn't really happy with that. Uh, that answer. And uh, that kind of led to um, the creation of the first nonsense arrangement, which uh, looks like a kindergarten child made it. Um, But it's the thought that counts. So I really just went on YouTube, learned how to make a paper flower um, and put put quotes inside. Um, My friend, he was a 22 year old male. So I didn't think silk flowers were a good option. Um, and I didn't think a teddy bear would suffice. Um, and you can't bring chocolates to someone who can't even open their mouth. So, um, so that's, that's kind of the route that I took. And I put quotes from, um, the TV show Seinfeld, the movie, the hangover, um, you know, different, sports figures throughout history, quotes from them, and just wrote them all in the flowers and uh, ended up hand delivering the arrangement to a hospital in um, in New Jersey. And uh, at first people tried to keep me from bringing it into the hospital because they thought they were flowers. Um, so I had kind of the initial swarm of nurses, you know, yelling, no, 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 you can't come. Um, and then it, you know, once it, it set in that you, this was all paper, um, then, you know, people started asking, oh, where can I get one? Um, you know, I, they said, I can't bring my, I can't bring my flowers in. And it, it just kind of, um, grew, grew from there. I mean, I was, I, I think I was 18 years old at the time. Um, so I knew nothing. I'd taken one entrepreneurship course in, in college, which was the first time I think I was even introduced to the term entrepreneurship. Um, and I had liked it, but I never thought that I would be the one that actually started the business, had the idea. Um, and, and my mom really supported me, um, a lot in encouraging me to kind of see this through and, and see where I could take it. Mm-hmm. So hence your name, Nonsense Flowers. Yes, yeah. yes. So it's, it's a classic tale of entrepreneurialism, this really, isn't it? Seeing a problem and coming up with a solution and then finding that other people also want that solution. Of course. Which, which is great. So how does your marketing, you, you, you've obviously done a marketing degree and how does that help you in your business? Oh, goodness. Well, um, so my concentration in marketing was in um, sales and uh, branding. So those are the two um, kind of focus areas that I was in. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, it also, there was a little bit of market research. I took courses on, you know, copywriting for um, marketing materials, um, how to talk to customers, um, it, different kinds of things like that, how to create a consistent brand, how to message your company. Um, 
and I, I was I was kind of fortunate enough at the time when I was building the company to be in a university uh, environment because I could turn to a lot of my professors to ask their opinion or to have them review things that I was working on. And um, since it was a smaller university, they had the time to give a little bit of extra, um, you know, a little bit of extra focus or, or time to help me out with it. So, um, I would say it helped in a lot in my confidence in terms of what I knew, um, you know, a larger company would do, what I, what the traditional, um, way of marketing was, um, and then, um, really how to do my research. I think that's where it really helped is, is the research component. Um, but I mean, as, as I'm sure you know, with a startup, it's it's completely different than mm-hmm. what you're going to do just simply because of the budget. You know, yeah. you can you can um, learn to do all of these campaigns and and uh, content creation and write all this wonderful copy, and then you go to put it out there, you know, show the world everything that you've done and you get the, the bill for it. And you're like, Oh, well <laughs> I can't do this as much as I thought I could, no. <laughs> you know? So it's, um, I, I would say the degree is definitely helpful. The reason I chose the two, um, concentrations to study both marketing and entrepreneurship is because I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I, I figured those two things would apply to everything. Mm. Um, and that was true. You know, they, they both apply. I would say the entrepreneurship degree was, was a bit more helpful. Um, but, but certainly, um, the, the marketing degree, it just, even if it's just confidence, some people are natural salespeople. Some people naturally know what, um, you know, what the world wants to hear and, and how to, how to say things to people. Um, and then some people like me need a little bit more context around it to mm-hmm. really be sure about what I'm doing. So that, that's kind of what it gave me. Okay. Thanks for that. So what do you enjoy most about what you do, Elizabeth? Uh, definitely, uh, seeing the, the impact of, of our products and the company itself. So, um, I think I was in high school and I was first introduced to Tom's Shoes. I mean, it was a very, it was a young company at the time. It was pretty new. People still thought they were ugly. They weren't quite cool yet. Um, and that was kind of my initial introduction to social entrepreneurship. This yeah. idea that um, a company can make a profit and sustainably give back to the world mm-hmm. in some way, do good in some way. So um, I, I really liked that idea. I had no idea what I was going to do with it. I, it was just one of those things that I really liked. Um, and then once I got to college, I uh, took a course in um, Buenos Aires, Argentina. And we worked with a, um a internet radio startup company. So then I got to see... Um, you know, I got to see how your traditional company, your traditional startup, so to speak, your regular, if that's what you want to call it, startup works. So with nonsense, um, I kind of fused all of those ideas. And, um, you know, the the products obviously are made to help people in in situations that are are difficult or Mm -hmm. trying. um, and, And that's what they were originally designed for. They're used for just about everything. Um, but, you know, we get on the customer side, we get calls in. Um, for example, there was a, a school bus crash, a bunch of, um, I think they were maybe f- five to eight years old was the age of the kids who were in the accident. Um, and one of the little girls was in intensive care. And her teacher called us and ordered a, an arrangement to be sent to the hospital. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, we delivered it to the hospital. Um, and we had to go through a lot because uh, they weren't wanting to disclose her location because of, um, 
you know, news reporters and people wanting to know more about the incident, things like that. So we dropped it off with a nurse, had the nurse bring it in. Um, and about, I don't know, two, three weeks later, um, we got a call from a woman who turned out to be the little girl's mom. And she was calling to thank us because her little girl came out of the coma and was asking her to read the messages that her teacher had sent through the flowers um, over and over and over again. And just getting calls like that, knowing that this woman, this woman didn't even order the arrangement, mm-hmm. you know, she, she benefited from it. Her daughter benefited from it. And they cared so deeply about that, that they called us to personally thank us. And, and that happens a lot. Um, so on the customer side, that's, that's really the most enjoyable thing is, is seeing that impact for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then on, on the the supplier side, um, all of the paper that we use to make our, our bouquets is um, fair trade certified and um, made it in, a, in, a, in an environmentally sustainable way. Um, so we get to read the stories of these women who um, are usually the main uh, income earners for their family. Um, and because of their their job at these different cooperatives that make these papers, they can they can afford to feed themselves, their families, send their children to school. Um, so just knowing that through this one company, through this one small company, we can have such an impact on on anyone, mm-hmm. you know, anyone on the customer side, and then also have an impact on people, you know. Halfway around the world, um, that that is just that's my favorite thing about it. Mm. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, what is it that drives you? I mean, I suspect you've already talked about that in what you've already said, but is, what actually drives you, Elizabeth? Yep. Um, so, so you're right. Uh, a lot of a lot of what I love about what I do is also um, kind of the driving factor. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is uh, one picture of a little girl. So we, we, uh, will go into hospitals, uh, children's hospitals, adult hospitals, um, and do workshops with the patients. Um, let them make their own flowers, things like that. And I have a picture from one of those workshops and it's, um, a little girl. She had to be eight or nine years old. Mm -hmm. Um, and she has a face mask on and, um, you know, she's, she she's hooked up to a couple of different things um, and she's holding her version of a nonsense arrangement and you can tell just by her eyes that she's smiling Mm -hmm. and I keep that picture on my desk and every time you know I look at financial statements and I'm like oh god how are we gonna you know how are we gonna get through this month or um you know, I, I look at different things and it's not growing fast enough. I always look at that picture and that is why I am doing this. I am doing this because there are people in that situation who might not be smiling, mm. if not for something that can brighten their day. Um, and it, it's so small, mm. you know, and if you just, you know, oh, I, I, I received a uh, paper flower arrangement because I can't have live flowers. Okay, great. Um, but when you actually see the, the emotional and the psychological um, differences that something bright and colorful can have on people, um, you know, if you just dig a little bit deeper, it, it's an extraordinary difference. Mm. And um, so, so that's kind of what drives me through all of those mm. um, kind of tougher decisions. Mm-hmm. It must be incredibly gratifying knowing that what you're doing affects people like that and helps them so much. So it is. It you- it most certainly is, and and you know I think it's the way that um, a lot of people um, are are kind of leaning towards these days. Um, yeah. You know, you see all these articles come out in the news about uh, millennials who you know won't work for a company if they don't do something to help their communities or if they uh, don't operate in the most environmentally efficient way, yeah. um, things like that. So I, I really think there is a trend towards, um, you know, doing something good 
as part of what you do every single day. Mm, absolutely. So how do you relax when you're not working in your business? <laughs> that, that would assume that I'm ever not working on the company, correct? <laughs> you must take some time out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, you know, technology, we have a love-hate relationship because um, it really lets you work all the time, um, which I would not suggest to anyone. But, but no, um, in, in all honesty, I do try and uh, take the weekends off, um, just not because... I, uh, I think it's a, it's a great idea in terms of productivity, but, um, I do think, uh, for my own well being that taking some time off is, is good. So, um, that's actually why I stuck with the horses, um, and still have, uh, my horse who is in her early twenties now. <laughs> so, um, it, it was one of those things where, you know, I'd go to, I'd go to the gym, I'd go running. Um, I'd even go to yoga classes. And while I was doing all of those things, I'd still be thinking about work. Um, but with horses, they are very large animals, um, and very unpredictable. So your head cannot be anywhere except in the present moment focusing on what this large mostly stubborn sometimes temperamental animal is, is doing you know right in front of you so um really that the horses play a big part in in my ability to to kind of decompress relax and uh, stop working um but you know i also you know go out with friends um you know, spend time trying different things. I think I mentioned the dance classes and, um, you know, things like that. Just started taking a Lindy Hop class, which is African swing dancing. So, um, you know, just trying to trying to kind of do all these different things. Um, most of it is active, though. I don't think I can – I have a hard time relaxing while sitting still. So, <laughs> Apart from when you're on your horse. <laughs> Very true. Very yeah. true. And do you have any entrepreneurial role models? Um, yes, actually. So I, I mentioned um, Tom's Shoes um, and Blake Mykoski is the founder of that company. Um, and he was, he was the initial role model um, just because he I, – I can't say he was the first social entrepreneur um, – because then you, you kind of get into the question of, all right, well, did Muhammad Yunus come first with microfinancing? And there are people beforehand doing things that were similar. But um, I think Blake Mykoski was really the first one that, that phrased it in a way that almost everyone can understand. Um, and he really stuck with it because he's gotten a lot of um, people trying to make similar products and sell them in a similar way. Um, he's got people saying, you know, if you really want to do good for people um, and have a social impact, why don't you just give everything away? Why are you keeping money for yourself? Um, so he's he's kind of run the gamut of, um, of kind of the, the different – things that can happen on the positive and the negative side for, for a social entrepreneur. So I would say that he is, he was really the first. Um, and I actually saw him speak in person, which was my introduction to him. Um, and what he said just made sense. It made total sense to me, um, because I had worked in a lot of nonprofits and I found that regardless of the, the intentions of the organization, um, it's hard to keep good talent if you can't pay them as bad as that sounds. Um, you know, if you, you have someone and all of a sudden they decide they want to start a family and they realize they can't afford to send their kids to school um, or to the school that the kid wants to go to or, you know, any, any kind of array of, of things could happen. Um, you know, they might want to do the best thing, but, but someone else gives them a better offer. So I, I just saw how hard it was for nonprofits to continue um, creating sustainable change 
for the people that they were trying to help. So Blake Mykoski really um, phrased it in a way that made me understand that social enterprise was a viable alternative to the nonprofit model. Yeah, Tom, um, just just interrupting you slightly there, Tom's Shoes, they are the company that give a pair of shoes away every time you buy a pair of shoes, aren't they? I think, yep, yeah. yep, and now they... Um, now they also do uh, eye care. So yeah. buy a pair of eyewear. They give um, either an eye surgery or, or some kind of eye treatment uh, to someone who is blind or, or in need. Mm. Um, and they also they have a couple of other things, too, that are newer, mm-hmm. um, you know, in terms of books and, and things like that. So... Um, they are – that was his company, is his company, mm-hmm. um, and, and he's really grown it. And I think they, they just founded a, an organization or some kind of foundation um, to help social entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the, the, second, the second role model um, is quite a bit different. Um, and if anyone watches the show Shark Tank, yeah. they, uh, they know her, um, and it's Barbara Corcoran. Mm-hmm. Um, and she is she's in real estate in New York, but I uh, first met her at a, an event for um, women in business or women entrepreneurs, um, and she she, uh, she was absolutely hysterical. Um, she she explained how she was one of I don't know, eleven or twelve children um, mm-hmm. and worked in a diner. Ended up following a boyfriend to New York City, um, worked with him in his real estate company, um, and then he ended up choosing the secretary over her. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so she took half of his clients and started her own organization, uh, her own real estate company. And it, it just, she, <laughs> her story is, is just, it's amazing because she knew nothing about real estate other than what you know she had done with him, um, and you know she's she talk about sending in press releases about this celebrity who buys this apartment in Manhattan, uh, in New York City, and it wasn't her apartment. She didn't make the sale, but she knew that newspapers would, you know would be interested in knowing, you know, where Jennifer Lopez is living now. Mm. Uh, and she ended up on the front page of the New York Times. That's handy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the Corcoran group says that J-Lo is moving into this apartment in Manhattan. Um, and it, it was just one of those stories where, it, you know, it really showed that no one really knows what they're doing. But if you, <laughs> if you really think about things and, you know, play it smart, then, you know, it it can work out for you, but she's just uh, she's just a real person. You know, she's wildly successful, but yeah. a very real person who who kind of shows that you don't need that degree from you know Harvard or or Stanford or you know Oxford or any any really you know well world renowned school um, to really make it. And I, I think it was just a great story. So I, I definitely look up, look up to her. Mm-hmm. Okay. Elizabeth, can we go back to the time before you were an entrepreneur? And can you tell us about the difficulties that you had to overcome when you started your business? Oh, goodness. Well, I was, eight, <laughs> I was 18 years old yeah. and I'd only known the word entrepreneur for about three months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's where we're starting. Okay. And, uh, and I, uh, oh goodness, goodness. So I, I was in college, uh, and I had declared my major already, but the classes that I had taken were most of my liberal arts class. So I had a great English class under my belt. I had, um, maybe one statistics class, a couple of calculus classes, um, maybe an art history class thrown in there. So, so really, uh, no knowledge of business, no formal formal knowledge of business, um, no formal knowledge of marketing. I knew pretty much the only thing I knew was that I needed a website of some sort. Um, 
and and I knew that I knew nothing. Um, those were pretty much the two the two constants. I knew nothing, but I need a website. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and thinking back on it now, I'm just hitting myself in the head. <laughs> but um, you know, I did have professors to help me out, so. Um, I was lucky to have mentors who, instead of telling me what to do, um, it taught me how to ask the correct questions. Yeah. And um, I think that if they had told me what to do, I probably would have made fewer mistakes. However, at the same time, I would probably still be making mistakes mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that are you know larger uh, in terms of, the the catastrophe measure following. So, um, you know, I was lucky that, that they kind of helped, helped me go through the process. Um, but, but really being, you know, uneducated, so to speak in the business world and how things were done in business, um, being a five foot four blonde female, um, didn't help my case at all. Um, and you know, just thinking that the website was what I needed to start with. I mean, there you go. That's, that's like a recipe for disaster right there. (laughs) So, so that was, that was kind of, those were kind of the biggest things. And, and, um, you know, the, the website, goodness, that was, I think that was where I, I blew most of the money that I had. Um, which was a terrible idea. Mm-hmm. Um, there are so many different and better ways you can go about doing that. That will cost you no money, um, just a little bit extra time. But I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, and did you have any doubts that delayed you starting your business? You know, I probably should have. Um, but there's this website called LegalZoom yeah. where you can, uh, you don't even need a lawyer. You can just go ahead and, and, to register a, a company through that website. So I kind of just jumped and and thought afterwards. Um, you know, at the time I was, uh, it was the summer in between my first and second year at university. So um, I was at home with my mom um, and she she's looking at me kind of toying with this idea and I had been emailing with different professors about it and she said you know what I uh I started saving money for your college education when you were born Mm -hmm. um and she said I really don't think that I should have to wait for that return on my investment so you can finish your degree and then go start a company (laughs) um and you know my mom's always been a little bit kooky, but she is a single mom um, and, and raised me. I'm her only child, uh, and she wasn't supposed to be able to have kids, so she had me at 40. So we have kind of a kooky relationship, um, but she was, she was just extremely supportive in, in saying, um, you know what, this is the time to take that risk. Yeah. You've got nothing to lose, really. Um, you know, at 18, 19 years old, you can still, um, you know, live at home and, and not be judged for it, Mm -hmm. you know, not feel bad about it. Um, and, uh, so I really just, I was like, okay, we're going to do it and filed for, for an LLC and, um, registered nonsense. Once I got the name, registered the name, um, registered the company and we were off. Um, but certainly I had doubts afterwards. Um, I, I mean, every day I'm like, why, why, why am I not, you know, in a comfortable salaried life, uh, working for some company? You know, why, (laughs) why did I decide to do this crazy thing? Um, but I think that's, that's part of being an entrepreneur is, um, you know, even if you know you're crazy, you still do it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's something that you're almost, it's, it's almost, someone suge- suggested the other day to me, it's a, gen- it's a gene in you and you can't help it. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> You've just got to pursue I it. <laughs> I agree completely. Um, and you know, one of my professors put it in, in the best way. He, um, he was presenting, uh, an award and he, 
was explaining the student who received it. The student turned out to be me. Mm-hmm. Um, but he, he said, this is one student who will get pissed off a lot in life. And every time she gets pissed off, she's going to start a company to fix it so that she doesn't have to be pissed off anymore. <laughs> and I looked at him and I was, I was just thinking, Professor Palin, is this really what you think of me? <laughs> but it's true. It's true. Entrepreneurs are the people who, who don't like something and instead of complaining about it, they fix it. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times that's the crazier thing to do because it's uncomfortable and it's uncertain and it's weird and it's different and probably none of your friends are going to do the same thing or even close to the same thing. Um, but you still do it. Yeah, absolutely. So what mistakes did you make that slowed your journey? And obviously I think you've given us a few hints at those, but is there anything else yep. that comes to mind? Yep. So, um, so the website was one, yeah. um, and and that's a very that's like a technical mistake, um, and and then I would say, I would say, trusting the wrong people, um, and and not in a terrible a doom and gloom kind of way, but um, there are a lot of organizations out there that are, um, you know that say they are there to help entrepreneurs and to help people working on their company and, and all those different kinds of things. And people out there that really want to, you know, quote unquote, help you in your journey. Um, and I think I was almost blindly trusting people um, in that I wanted to learn from everyone. Mm-hmm. But I... I think that the biggest thing was I was so focused on learning from everyone that I forgot to keep in mind my vision for the company, you know, my goal, where I wanted the company to go. Um, Because a lot of people, you know, yes, they're doing these things, but some people might not be doing them out of the goodness of their heart. You know, they might be doing it because of a need for economic development in a certain area. They might be doing it because they're connected to a related industry um, or, or have a similar market and they think that it will help, you know, their company or their product. Um, so I think it's, it's really important to, um, and I've learned this now, keep in mind what you as the entrepreneur want for your company and, you know, be open to the advice of others. Um, I, I would say that uh, it definitely can't hurt to get as much as advice as possible, but, you know, to just take that advice in stride with, um, you know, your vision mm. so that you don't lose that. And I think, um, and I went through a lot of things and um, did things in, in a lot of different ways where one way would have worked. So, um, for instance, a business plan, right? It's an important document. Everyone wants to have it. Um, it, You know, there are so many templates out there for your financial projections and your market goals and your research and your industry data, Mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. You know, use your business plan as a roadmap. You don't need to have this, you know, five tier Excel document with all of this data in it, because honestly, you don't have that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, it's, it's, it's just one of those things where, um, again, it's someone who was, uh, was taking a corporate mindset to it where, where in my head, I was thinking this is going to be bootstrapped to a small business and then grow from Mm -hmm. there. Um, which is one of the reasons why we didn't take any outside investment. Okay. And what are some of the things that you did before you started your business that would be helpful tips to some of the listeners who haven't yet taken the first step on the entrepreneur way? Um, so, so definitely I did my research, um, kind of in that story, uh, of how the company started. I was lucky enough to be in a hospital, in the environment that I wanted my arrangements to be in and get 
people's opinions, get people's feedback. Um, but, but I definitely think, you know, the biggest thing about being an entrepreneur is are you solving a problem? And if your product or service is solving a problem, then go out there and, and really talk to the people who you are, you know, helping essentially, um, and, and see, would you use this? You know, I think that's a really big thing that a lot of people don't do. They'll, uh, you know, come up with this idea and ideas can be great and fun, but people have got to want your idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I think that was, um, one of the biggest things that I did was I just went to hospitals and I talked to people, um, at bars and restaurants and, you know, anywhere I could, I, um, went to pitch events and, um, different, different kind of conferences. And everywhere I went, I said, you know, this is my idea. This is a picture of it. What do you think? You know, would you use it? Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, at, at the same time, you have to be careful that none of your questions are, are leading people to a certain answer. Yeah. Um, but, but really doing, doing that research, I think, is, uh, is really important and making sure that this is really something that you love because you have got to love it if you're going to make it all the way through to the end. Um, because I think, I think startups and entrepreneurship and being an entrepreneur has, has kind of been um, glamorized by – you know, movies about uh, Facebook and stories about Twitter and Snapchat and mm -hmm. um, all of these different kinds of platforms, you know, that develop an app and, you know, become famous kind of things. But that's not really how it works for, for most entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. um, and it's usually not how it works for your first venture. Uh, it's, a, it's a slow process. It is a grind um, and you definitely have to have some grit and really love what you're doing because um, you will get burnt out. Mm. Elizabeth, can we now talk about the entrepreneurial journey itself once you've started your business? Mm -hmm. And can you tell us what you, whether you think culture is important from the beginning in a business? Um, absolutely. I, uh, so, so in the beginning, you're not going to have – I mean, you could, but I wouldn't suggest having any kind of, um, you know, uh, pamphlet or, um, you know, written plan on how people are going to act and behave and feel and what the culture is going to be like. Um, the culture of a company is very much a reflection of the company's leadership, mm -hmm. right? So... Um, you know, really understand what is important to you as a leader. So for me, I have a um, kind of work hard, play hard mentality where, um, you know, I will put in everything. It will be in a 100% effort all the time. Um, and that is what I expect from everyone that works with me. Mm -hmm. And I say works with me because transparency is also big. Everyone who works at Nonsense has the opportunity to, you know, design something, to share a creative opinion, to suggest something, to be a part of the company's growth process. Um, so that's that's kind of what our culture has has developed into, where I have very high standards, and so do everyone. So does everyone who mm -hmm. works at nonsense who works with nonsense um but at the same time it's not a, a strict and stringent environment you know you get the jo job done you do the job well and you have fun doing it um and and i am friends with all the people that that work with me um and so that's part of our culture but i think a really important thing is that culture comes from leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't be a leader that says one thing and does another. So regardless of, of you know, what you say you want, it's, it's really how you act and what you do. And that you don't need something to, to um, you know, tell people what the culture is. It will develop into that. So I, I think it's important, um, certainly, but it's almost an organic thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And knowing what you know now, is there anything that if you'd known it when you started out would have helped you to shortcut the learning curve? I mean, like I said, um, I now I have a lot more, you know, technical knowledge um, mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, web design, coding, graphic designs, um, a lot more knowledge about, um, you know, using social media platforms to market, things like that. Um, but, you know, knowing the type of person that I am, if I had found a way to shortcut one thing, I would just end up, you know, you know struggling with something else. So I don't think, um, I'm, I'm very much a proponent of learning through experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and I almost feel like I, you know, the, the lessons don't really sink in unless I've, you know, really felt, (laughs) felt the repercussions from a wrong decision. Um, but thankfully, you know, when you start out and kind of bootstrap it for a little while, it lets you have that learning curve without a whole ton of risk. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess, shortcutting the learning curve. Um, there are a lot of resources, um, out there now, a lot of, um, apps that have courses on, on different things that are, you know, $10 courses and you get, um, a whole bunch of content, video, lecture, all that kind of stuff. Um, you can go on just about any, entrepreneur or startup magazine source and get information on marketing, on finance, on hiring, on, you know, on an array of different things that you might need. So, um, certainly you can take a more academic approach to it. Um, and again, that kind of goes back to doing your research, but I'm not entirely sure that there is any way to shortcut the learning curve on your first time around. And how much does gut feeling influence your decisions in your business? Uh, so, so I would say all the time. <laughs> okay. Um, it's it's kind of like, uh, oh goodness, it's uh, it's kind of like Wikipedia, you know, where where if you're trying to find the answer to something, you. Uh, go on Wikipedia and Mm -hmm. then you go to some other uh, source that's much more reliable to back up whatever you found on Wikipedia. So that's kind of how the gut feeling um, works with me is it's the gut feeling is the initial thing that says, I think this is what I should do. And then I'll go and and confirm that um, however I can. But, um, but but it really does. It does have a lot of influence. Mm -hmm. Life is made of constant change, whether we like it or not. And in fact, some people would say the only constant is change. Elizabeth, how do you try to keep up with change? Um, so I, I love change. <laughs> One mm-hmm. of those oddballs that really enjoys it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the, the best way that I've kind of kept up with it is um, is through social media. Um, I have a short attention span and not a lot of time. So, um, you know, mediums like Twitter are very helpful for me in terms of news and, and things like that, but also um, following people even on LinkedIn um, or, or different um, writers that I respect and uh, have already decided that yes, these people have valuable content to share. Um, they almost create a curated source of information on what's changing, what's the new, um, norm, you know, what should we expect? What should be get, should we be getting ready for? Um, so, so I think, um, you know, really just using the tools out there is the best way. Um, but at the same time, as, as an entrepreneur and as someone with a young company, um, you know, not all change is going to apply to your company. Um, so just because this is the new big thing doesn't mean that it's going to be the best big thing for your company, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, so those are really, that, that's really how I keep up with, with how the world is changing and, and how different, different things are going on and, and things like that. For instance, I went to the Forbes uh, 30 Under 30 conference um, in last fall. And a big thing that they were saying was that 
um, you know, image was big, right? Mm -hmm. Now video is big, but not formal videos, um, real videos. So videos that make people feel like you are a real person, that they're getting to know the real you. So that kind of tells me, all right, transparency is now big, right? Mm -hmm. And Forbes was kind of my source of curating all of that content, all of the information out there to figure out what, you know, the next big thing was going to be. Um, so I, I think it's great. I think as long as you, you know, you don't live in a cave or in a hole or something with no connection to the outside world, it's pretty easy, you know? <laughs> okay. And what is your favorite book on entrepreneurialism, business, personal development, leadership, or motivation? And can you tell us why you have chosen it? Yeah, so I, I actually um, thought of two. Yeah. One, which I, I know is my favorite, but it's been a while since I, I've read it. And that one um, is called The Monk and the Riddle. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it follows, um, it, it kind of gives you a look into uh, the Silicon Valley venture capitalist world. Um, but it, it's an extremely entertaining read. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, I I just loved it because it a lot of times when you hear about venture capital or you talk about getting outside investment, pitching to a VC firm, um, when you hear the word Silicon Valley, you get that nervous excitement, mm -hmm. but it's always nervous excitement, right? It's always, you know, oh my there are these great people out there that have lots of money that can help my company succeed, but it's still nervous. It's like them and you mm -hmm. as the entrepreneur. So this, this particular book um, really it just it kind of provides a more realistic um, view into the fact that these venture capitalists are people. They, they are people too. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they can see through things if it's not genuine. And that's all they're looking for is, is you know, genuine people um, with genuinely good ideas. And it's a really kind of, um, it's a good read. It's an easy read. Um, but it, it gives you a lot of insight. So that's, that's one. Um, the other one is the all in startup um, and that follows an entrepreneur through the Las Vegas uh, poker tournament, uh, the huge World Series of poker tournament. Um, and it kind of draws parallels between poker and entrepreneurship, um, which, which is interesting. But it does touch on a lot of, a lot of really good points on, um, you know, what you have to look out for, what you have to think about, um, and, and what you have to do to see, is this business going to succeed or fail? Um, why is this business not doing as well as I thought it was going to be? Um, and, and different things like that. But again, it's a fun read. Um, so, so I, I tend to, to recommend those two books. Okay. Thank you for that. Everyone, when you have a busy life, listening to audiobooks is a great way to expand your knowledge in the time when you may be doing other things, such as driving or when you are at the gym. We have a special offer for you of a free audiobook of your choosing. To choose your free audiobook, go to freeaudiobookoffer.com. As long as you haven't already signed up, then you will qualify. Elizabeth, what I'd like to do now is talk about a few things in the future. So, first of all, what one thing would you do with your business if you knew that you could not fail? Um, so, I would certainly expand it internationally. Um, it, it's, you know, it was interesting for me when um, when you reached out to me mm -hmm. because um, a lot of our uh, New, a lot of the, the news articles that have come out and stories that have come out about us have actually been in the UK, not in the US. Um, and it, it kind of, uh, you know, we've shipped to um, Belgium and to France. And it's a problem that, that really affects everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and I would certainly, you know, take that leap to, to really expand it internationally, which I hope one day I will be able to do. Um, at least that's the plan. But but if I knew it couldn't fail right this instant, that, that's what I would do. Mm -hmm. And what skill, if you were excellent at it, would help you the most to double your business? 
Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> what one skill? Yeah. Hmm. Um, you know, I I was actually looking at this question and uh, trying to, to figure out what that answer actually is. And I will tell you, I am not 100% sure what one skill, if I was excellent at it, would double my business. Um, but, but I certainly think uh, just the the willingness i guess you can break it down into sales but um you know the willingness to just go out there and talk to everybody um and the ability to do it well um and really get your story heard i think um i think that's a big one so um you know it's one thing to be to be comfortable talking with people and to enjoy it it's another thing to really actively go out and seek people to to really talk to and and um, for me sometimes I feel like it's a little bit pushy um, because I don't like it when people do that to me um, but you know there's a fine line there because you do have to get that story out um, so so I think I think uh, I think that would help the best mm-hmm. well I'm, I'm glad that my question got you thinking. In five years from now, if a well-known business publication was publishing an article on your business after talking to your customers and suppliers, what would you like it to say? This was another one. (laughs) (laughs) This was another one. Um, You know, it really goes back to that um, that initial question um, and conversation we had uh, at at the beginning of this chat um, about what I enjoy most Mm -hmm. and that's really knowing that we have an impact Mm -hmm. Um, and and I think that connects back to this question where I would you know I would love it to say you know what that impact was for you know uh, for the customers for the suppliers Um, really really kind of break it down, get their perspective of it. You know, how have we helped change your life? Mm-hmm. Okay. So we're now at the part of the show where you share three golden nuggets with us. So Elizabeth, what is your favorite quote and how have you applied it? Oh goodness. There are so many. <laughs> um, I think, I think my absolute favorite one uh, comes from Albert Einstein. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is not the one about insanity. Yeah. Uh, it is. Let me pull it up here. Um, logic will get you from A to B. Imagination will take you everywhere. Yeah. And um, I think that really applies to to every entrepreneur's journey because there, you know, you do need logic. You know, to get you from nothing to something, right? Mm -hmm. But you absolutely need imagination to see that end goal, to have that vision. You need to be able to imagine it in order to get there. Otherwise, you're, you know, using logic to get you from a known point A to a hopeful point B. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you have any favorite online resources that you can share that would be useful for us? Um, certainly. So, uh, so I mentioned earlier that there are a lot of courses out there that can help, help you work on skills, um, and, and different kind of things. If you didn't study certain things in, in university or in school, or if you just want to, um, you know, brush up on some skills, uh, the application is called Udemy. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's U D E M why i believe um and they're uh, most of the courses are ten dollars um and it's it's really great content so that's that kind of applies to just about everything um and then i um really (laughs) my favorite one is google (laughs) if you've heard of that um (laughs) (laughs) so uh I've learned, I've, I, you know, I've worked in an Excel, out of an accelerator with this company, um, and it, it really let me, uh, uh, let me meet different people, see different people, entrepreneurs from age 16 to, uh, you know, 65. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, I got the, 
the spectrum of people at different points in their careers deciding to uh, start companies. And the one thing I've learned is that everybody Googles, no matter how much experience you have, no matter how successful you have been before, everybody Googles. Um, And some people are afraid to Google. They think, oh, I should know the answer, right? Um, No, no one really knows what they're doing. Um, Everybody Googles. So uh, that is definitely your greatest tool as an entrepreneur is is just the ability to Google. Um, And then aside from that, using um, sites like Buffer, to kind of streamline your social media. Um, So social media is great for branding, right? Maintaining a presence, talking with your customers, uh, sharing things in a a um, non-sales kind of way. But it's extremely distracting, um, very time-consuming, and and sometimes sometimes can pull focus. So um, sites like Buffer for um, social media, uh, Tailwind for Pinterest, um, Iconograph for Instagram, and uh, there's there are a number of them for Twitter, but um, a lot of things that can that can kind of help regulate and um, streamline those processes. Those are great too. Okay, thank you. And what is your best advice to other entrepreneurs? Oh, goodness. I, I would say uh, is, it, you know, I think um, I was watching, so I, I was watching the uh, the playoff games for American football um, since it's almost the Super Bowl mm-hmm. last Sunday. And um, the Panthers is from North Carolina. It's our team. Um, they, this will be their second career Super Bowl. So they literally never make it to the Super Bowl. And they had a phenomenal season. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were interviewing the coach. And a, the coach had a mentor who said, do it your way. Now, don't worry how other coaches have, have done it. Don't worry what other teams are doing. Do it your way. Because... If you succeed, you know you did it your way. And if you fail, <laughs> you know you did it your way. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's never a question about that. So, so I, would, I would say my best advice is, you know, do it your way. Do, you know, build this company your way. It is, it is your kind of your dream, your, your company. Um, and that's not to say don't take advice from others. Um, but you know, as we were talking about earlier, take that advice, but never lose track of your way of doing it. Never lose track of your dream because that's what your company is. That Mm -hmm. is what it is. Um, so, so I think that would be the biggest, um, biggest piece of advice. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would kind of, uh, piggy that with a second um, and and to really uh, value your network and continually be growing your network um, not superficially mm-hmm. really grow that network genuinely mm-hmm. um, just it, you know and it it all goes back to just being be yourself be genuine be yourself you know don't forget who you are why you're doing things um, and and really bring people into that um, and you know, I've I've had an absolute blast doing that, um, mm. and you know, maybe it will work, maybe it won't. I will keep you posted on that one. <laughs> um, but I think that's that's the best thing any of us can do. Yeah, everyone. If you didn't manage to get a note of Elizabeth's favorite resource or her favorite book, you can find the links on Elizabeth's show notes page. Just go to theentrepreneurway.com and search for Elizabeth or Elizabeth Greenberg in the search box. Elizabeth, is there anything else that you'd like to add about your business? 
Well, I think we have uh, covered quite a lot. I would mm-hmm. certainly encourage people to um, find us on uh, social media. I personally manage all of our accounts. Um, so, you know, shoot, shoot us a message. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm happy to, to answer anyone's questions um, and uh, really continue the conversation. Okay. Elizabeth, it's been an absolute honour having you on here. You've really given me a feeling that we've got to know the real you and you've provided us with some really great tips and insights. So thank you very much for coming on here and giving us your time. Thank you for, for having me. I'm very glad that, uh, that you reached out. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Entrepreneur Way. Subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Twitter at Neil D. Ball. Ball. 